Okay, I hope you've got some questions. Otherwise, we're going to finish really early, which some of you are going, yeah. Okay, uh, are we all back? If you are, say hello. I see Jess, Michaela, Ian Norell, and Philo. I can't see Carolyn, Fermi, and Pos Cosmo. So if you are there and ready to start, Carolyn's back. Uh, hello, Carolyn. Jacinta's back. Kayla's back, but Fermi and Cosmo, are you there? Neil's back. All right. Oh, thumbs up. Cosmo's giving me a thumbs up. Fermi. Fermi Tewu. I can't remember the other six names. He's got six names or so. I tried to memorize it, but I just didn't do a good job. Okay. Anyway, we're going to start because we don't have too, too much time. Uh, Matthew 8, verse 9. If you've got your Bibles with you, which you should because you're at Bible College, Matthew 8, verse 9 says this. Okay, so it's the story of the, the faithless centurion. I'm going to read you from verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Shall I come and heal him? Shall I come to your house? Shall I come to where you are and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just, oh, mind you, that's a belief right there, isn't it? A wrong belief. Uh, uh, but just say, because none of us are worthy for him to come into the roof of our house, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And here's what he understood. is his belief system being exposed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Okay, what was he saying? What was his belief system? He says, I understand authority. I am a centurion in the army and I don't have to go and do everything myself. I just tell this one, do it, and it gets done. I'm the boss. And Lord, I know you are the boss. You don't even have to come into my house and lay hands on the sick. You don't even have to speak to my daughter face to face. You can actually, where you are, I believe right now, you can say healed and she'll be healed. Right? Powerful. That's his belief system. What faith this man had to actually just know that he was talking to the Son of God. Right? And I love how Jesus is able to minister according to our faith levels. I love that he, you know, if, if, you know, if the guy said, you need to come to my house and lay your hands on my child, then she will be healed. Jesus would have done that because it's according to his faith. Uh, but he said, no, you don't even have to come to my house. You just need to speak. right?" But the whole thing behind this is he says, I am a man under authority. Do you see that? He says, I'm a man under authority. And then I tell this one go and they do it. And he basically outlines this whole concept that if you are under authority, you have authority. If you are not under authority, you don't have authority. Authority has been given by God. It is placed over your life by God. Not just the good authority, even the bad authority over your life, you've been placed in that structure by God, right? And when you come under that authority, you actually have authority. But if you don't come under that authority, then you have no authority. We see that with um, the, the A-Team. Now, I might be showing you my age. Have you guys watched the A-Team? 
All right. Uh, <laughs> oh no. Okay, so the A team, they're a renegade team, right? They're four guys and they they solve problems and but they're all criminals they 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 they're not doing it in the law so whatever they do they can't ask the police to help them they can't ask the government to help them they're doing good things but they've got to do it all by themselves because they're running from the law themselves so they don't have an authority they take authority but they, they step out of their authority, but they don't have authority. So when they're trying to stop something, they've got to rely on themselves. They can't call in the police, the government, even though they're doing something good, because they're not under authority, they have no authority. And it's the same in leadership. Look, if you're not under authority, you have no authority. That's the honest truth. And there isn't a person that, God has put on the earth that is an authority to themselves. So you may go, oh, well, one day I want to be a senior pastor. Well, even when you're the senior pastor, you've got a board. You've got a wife or a husband. You've got, a, you know, an eldership. You've got a state denomination or somebody oversighting you. Or you've got a national, you've got the government, you've got the police. You're never going to be without authority over your life. So rather than working against the authority, understand that God has established authority to protect us. He's established every authority in our life. And you can keep fighting authority because, and most people who fight authority are ones that have been hurt by authority in the past. So every time you find yourself resisting authority, they don't have to be bad authority. But if you find your spirit and your heart resisting authority, it's probably a wound from being hurt from authority in the past, right? But every time you do that, you can't actually give in to that. You've actually got to question that and go, hold on. God says all authority has been established by God. All authority that's been established by God. So why am I kicking against the authority that is in my life? When actually, if I choose to go with it, I might actually bless my authority. I will definitely bless my life and my future possibilities. One of my sons, who will remain nameless, uh, <laughs> was telling me that in his private school, Christian school, where the people love Jesus, they have introduced uh, for my son and all his friends the rule that they must tuck their shirts in, right? And they must have a belt. And, and uh, he has decided, he's telling me this is ridiculous, you know, I tuck the shirt in, I've got to wear a belt, this is stopping the freedom of my rights. And me and my friends, we choose not to. And I said to him, so how's that going for you? How's that going for you? But the, I, I'm not going to let them steal my rights. Okay, how's that going for you? Because I get detentions all the time. And okay, and demerits and detentions. Okay, and do you think you're changing anything by doing that? No, I'm not. Do you think you're making life easier for those who are your God-given oversight? Are you a pain or are you a pleasure? Right? Are you an asset or a liability? Do you think when the teachers have an opportunity to promote students, do you think your teacher would consider promoting you? Do you think you'll ever be in a place in that school to speak into changing real issues? Or because of your behavior, are you disqualifying yourself? Are you making teachers roll their eyes when you walk into the room? Are you making life harder for yourself? Because whenever you rebel against authority, you may think you're standing up for your individuality, but you're actually making a rod for your own back. So I said, so maybe tuck in your shirt, wear a belt and suck it up. Just maybe. And your life, you would actually get your recesses back instead of being in detention. And, you know, and so, so he, it re, he really had to stop and think about that. 
because he was telling me one of his friends got nominated for a school head school captain or something and got the votes everyone voted in but the teachers had the final say and the teachers said no you're not going to be the head you're going to be the vice right and i said to him that could be you god may call you into leadership you know you may want to have your heart set on something and maybe even the people think so but because you've worked against your authority the teacher said not that kid i can't I can't be bothered having him working with me so closely. Let's put them under. So are you a blessing to your leadership? Are you an asset to those that are above you? I'm not talking about sucking up. I'm not talking about fawning. I'm not talking about doing it to get uh, promotion. I'm actually talking, I'm talking about honouring authority as you would honour the Lord because that's what he actually tells us to do with authority. Treat your authority like you treat the Lord. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ. Love the church. Everything we do to each other and to the authorities in our life, we're supposed to be doing what we do to the Lord. We're supposed to be doing to them. All right? And so here's the challenging thing. Are you rebelling against any authority in your life right now and here's the thing you and i are very good at justifying very good aren't we we're so good at justifying yes of course i am but let me tell you why i'm rebelling against that authority ah, stop stop are you rebelling against a god-given authority in your life or oh, here's another question. Are you honoring all the God-given authorities in your life? So you may go, I'm not rebelling, but let me tell you what, I don't like them, and I tell everybody that I don't like them, and I don't even want to talk about it. And I, well, that's not honor. You see, when the Bible's in uh, Exodus, when the the Ten Commandments, the, the, the Fifth Commandment is honour your mother and father, that it will go well with you. So this is that whenever we honour our authority, there is actually a kickback from God, God himself, not the person, right? Of course, when you honour authority, they might actually want to work with you, they might have the opportunity to promote you, but God says forget whether that person will honour you or promote you or open a door for you. I and personally going to bless you if you honor your mother and your father, right? And it's really, really hard to honor authority that you feel doesn't deserve honor. Really hard to honor authority that has let you down. But remember, honor's got nothing to do with what the person has done. When you're honoring your authority, you're not honoring them for what they've done. You're honoring them for the position they hold over your life. God put them there. And I remember I had this dream one day that, <laughs> I'll just be very honest with you, I, I'm, I am, my, my political leanings may come out here, all right? But there was a particular prime minister that we had that uh, his last name rhymed with dud. So, uh, blah, 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 blah is a dud, right? So, you know, and so I was going around, you know, uh, Rudd is a dud, Kevin Rudd is a dud. And, um, and I, it was a joke, it was, you know, I just, whatever. One night, the Lord gave me a dream, and I don't get dreams often. I, God doesn't speak to me that way. That's how Sharon hears from God. But because sometimes I'm so thick, um, the only time I stop talking enough to hear from God is when I'm sleeping. <laughs> and uh, so he woke me up. And in, so he, I had a dream, and in the room, I'm sitting in a front row of church. So I know this is my church, and to my right is the prime minister at that time, Kevin Wright. And he starts to say, turn to me and he says, hey, Joel, it really hurts me that you say, you say I'm a dud. <laughs> and the presence of God hit me in that dream, in that meeting, and I start weeping 
I fall to the ground on the front row, not because Kevin Rudd said it to me, but because the Spirit of God said, how dare you touch my anointed? And I'm weeping and I wake up from my dream weeping, you know, one of those sort of dreams where it's so real that you carry on after you've woken up. And I'm weeping and repenting. And that day I realized that it doesn't matter who comes into the nation's leadership position. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or not. It doesn't matter if their political beliefs are in line with mine. If God allowed them to be my leader, I will honor them. I can disagree with their policies. If they ask me to do something that's against the word of God, I will not do it, but they don't often make you do stuff that is against the word of God. They might get you to do stuff that is against your style, your preference, your personality, or your, or your thinking. That you have to do, but if it's against the word of God, you don't have to do that. And I remember that day I made a commitment that whoever sits in that chair over my life, I will honour, bless, pray for, speak well of. All right, And so that's what God wants with the authority in our life. Not only that we don't rebel against authority, but that we actually learn to honour. A, a, a few years later, he, well, not even a few years later, then Kevin Rudd went out, Julia came in, Kevin Rudd came in, Julia went out. You know, then we had that, that multiple spinning plates of prime ministers during that time. And I saw Kevin Rudd at the airport. And um, I went up to him and I just, because he had been kicked out by then, I went up to him at the airport and I saw him and, and I just thanked him for serving as our Prime Minister, even though I disagreed with his policy. I didn't have to say all that part, but I just honoured him and I thanked him. And then he started asking me what I do and I told him I was a pastor in a church and he told me about how when he was a young boy, he used to go to church and he still believes in God. And, and we had this opportunity to share with the ex-Prime Minister about Jesus Christ. Pretty awesome, right? And, um, you know, I feel like God's saying, hey, listen, if you didn't repent, if you didn't change your heart, I would have shut that door. But if you honour your leadership, if you honour those that even you disagree with, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to open opportunities and open doors for you. Um, and yeah, we had a really great time and I got to pray for him because he had just been stabbed in the back by Julie Gillard at that time and he was wishing she would drop dead and die. And um, so he said, I'm really struggling with unforgiveness. <laughs> and he's opening up to me and I'm a total stranger sharing with our ex-Prime Minister. What a wonderful opportunity. And I just wanted to let you guys know that when you choose to honour people as you honour the Lord, when they're in leadership over you, you're honouring the position, not even their track record or whether they deserve it or not. I choose to honour you because you are my authority. God has put you there. And God has told me to pray for you. God has told me to encourage you. God has told me to make my leading of me a joy instead of a chore. If you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about. Some of your kids... Some of the time will make an absolute joy. You can't just love being their parent. And other times, I tell you what, it is a chore. It's an absolute chore. And we get to choose that when it comes to the authority that we are under. How do we correct authority? Should we correct authority? Open the uh, microphones and let me know your thoughts. Ian. That's Oh, oh Fermi. Oh, Fermi was back. Anyone? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say that's when you were first talking about um, respecting authority, that's something that I thought of because I had a situation at work the other day where one of my managers um, told me to label uh, sunglasses with like a label that wasn't correct. And I knew that it wasn't right. Um, and they had just recently come into the role and I've been working there for five years and I know like the policy, what the policy is when it comes to like labeling product, like it has to be explicitly aligned with that like brand. And she wanted to put something on there that wasn't that brand. And I was like, oh, I don't think that we can do this. 
And then they were like, oh, well, it's fine. Like, I'm saying that you can do it. So I was like, okay. So then I started to do it and I was like, this doesn't feel right. So then I stopped. And then luckily one of our regional managers was in that day. So then I went to her and I was like, hey, told me, I just wanted to double check. Like, is this okay for me to do or do I go about it in a different way? And they were like, no, like, this is actually what you should do. And she gave me like the proper procedure. So then I was like, was that me dishonoring her by going up to like another like leader and being like, hey, like this has happened and I didn't talk to them first or should I have been like, hey, I'm not sure this is the go. I think I'm going to go talk to someone else. So I was like, I was like, was that me dishonoring them or was that like, okay? Like, yeah. Look, it's, it's very tricky. Um, the first thing I would do is just check to see whether the thing is even worth bringing up. Right. So, uh, for example, with my son, with his T-shirt, uh, his shirt being tucked in, is it even worth bringing up? Is it really worth it? Because I'm going to go to the principal. I'm going to start a petition. I'm going to. He's such a leader, that kid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so I said, well, is it even worth it? So whenever you're talking to correcting authority, the first question is, is it worth it? Is it a me issue or is it a integrity issue right if a new boss comes in and says i want you to change the prices well if they're the boss and they're allowed to change the pricing sure right but if you know it's an unintegral practice then you might go hold on i might need to take it one step further Okay, so the first thing is ask yourself, is this worth bringing up? Is this worth correcting? Is this a me issue uh, or is this a, a biblical integrity issue? Okay, so if you go, it's just me, I like these pricings, this person wants to put these pricings, but they're in charge, I'm going to go against what I like to do what they've asked to do. However, if it's an integrity issue, then you can't, right? Because there's one authority that overrides all other authority, and that is the Word of God. And so if there's something that's asking you to contradict the Word of God, something that's asking you to do something wrong, then, you know, you have to take it further. So then the next step would be how. So you know you've got to do something because you know this is now contradicting the Word of God. It's how. And Pastor Peter has done this so well because Pastor Peter has had to bring some stuff up to me many times when I've either not known that I'm doing something wrong or I thought it wasn't too bad a deal. And he's like, no, you can't do that. But he doesn't do that at a staff meeting in front of everybody and contradicts me out loud. He'll go, hey, PJ, can I just chat with you whenever you can? Right, so then he pulls me privately, and the, the reason for that is honor. Okay, we do that because we don't want to humiliate somebody, we actually want to honor them. They are our leader, and so there are seasons where you might go, Okay, this is a, a wrong thing, and I've got to correct it. I feel like I've got to correct it. It's not just a personality or a taste or a style thing, this is a real issue. Okay, next step go to your leader and ask them with honour whether you can speak to them. Use an honouring tone. Uh, do it privately, all right? Articulate the why, not just that I don't think we should do this. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. Why do you think you shouldn't do it? That's the most important thing. You know, listen, I'm, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I just want you to know that in the last five years, this is the price. This is how we've done it. This is what the bosses above you will ask of you. And I don't want it to come across like you're doing the wrong thing. So that's why I just thought I'd let you know, um, you know, and you're submitting it to that. Now, if that person doesn't change, but you feel like just bringing it up to them is enough, right? Cool. That's great. You know, so Peter's brought some stuff up to me. Sometimes I've gone, man, we've got to change that. I didn't know. Other times that Peter, I know what you're wanting us to do here, but I don't feel that's what we need to do. And here's some things that you didn't know, Peter, right? Because Peter, your authority is this level and you see that, but my authority is this level. And the higher the authority that the Lord takes you, the more the oversight 
right? Maybe Peter's just thinking about names in campus, but I've got to look after three campuses or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so then it's my responsibility, number one, to be humble enough as a leader to hear him. And number two, to be able to explain back to that person. But in the secular world, that doesn't happen. Even in the Christian world, that doesn't always happen. The leader might not humble themselves to hear, but then you've got to ask yourself the next question. Is telling them enough? In some situations, it is. It is enough. I've told you, I'm leaving it at your feet. You need to do whatever you need to do, okay? But if it is a criminal activity, if it is an ungodly activity, and that leader chooses not to do anything about it, then you've got to take it to a higher authority, okay? Now, for some of us, that higher authority is God, the highest authority. Pastor Sally Storer said, you know, every time, she, she, she hears the word submit. Some people get all angry. She sees submitting as ducking so that God can slap her husband. Right? <laughs> so she ducks so God can slap her husband. So she goes, okay, cool. I'll take it to a higher authority. And she'll go and she'll go and pray. And she goes, okay, babe, I'm submitting it to you. I trust you. I'll I think you're making the wrong decision, but I'm submitting it to you because you're an authority in our house and in my life. But then she goes and prays and God will speak to David and God give him a good slap across the head out of love, son, go back and sort this out with your wife, right? And we've got to trust that God is the supreme authority to be able to do that. So does that help, Fermi? Yeah, cool. All right. Um, there's this story in Genesis about a girl called Hagar and Ishmael. And the Bible says that when Hagar had a child through Abraham, um, she started to, uh, it, it went to her head, basically. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, uh, started to treat her badly, started to talk to her badly, treat her badly. And because of that, she ran away from her master, her authority, and hid in the desert. And the angel of the Lord goes to Hagar and says, what are you doing here? And she goes, oh, I'm running away from my master because she's treating me so badly, talking to me so meanly. You know, she's, she's, she's being so... I mean, of course, we know that he, she wasn't being beaten or anything like that because Hagar is the concubine of Abraham so that we knew that that's not the case and, and her son is the son of Abraham so we knew that that I'm not endorsing domestic violence or any sort of violent behavior is what I'm saying okay but we do know that there was tension between Hagar and Sarai and Sarai was saying mean things so Hagar decides you know I'm going to run away and the Lord says go back to your master and I will bless you. So Hagar goes back to her master, right? Later on, her master sends her away, remember, again, okay? But she did what God asked her to do, which is go back to the master, even though you guys are clashing, even though she said some mean words, even though it hasn't been a good experience, go back and I will bless you and I'm going to bless your son, and I'm going to bless your future generations if you can go back to your authority and sort it out, right? Because what we need to understand is rebellion against authority never only impacts one generation. It impacts many generations. It's things that like that that have passed down as generational curses from one generation to another. And so when we go back and sort out the issues that we have with authority to the best of our ability to honor God and to honor them, then God promises to bless you and the generations after you. That's his promise. Painful to do, easy to amen. <laughs> Isn't that true? Very painful to do. But so easy to aim in. But if you can start working that into your life. Uh, when I got this revelation, I had to change the way I spoke to my father. 
I had to change the way I prioritized phone calls from my mother um, because this sort of belief system should change, should affect your behavior, right? And um, I had to, so now when I'm in a meeting, if the national president, Pastor Wayne Alcon, calls me, no matter where I am, I say, excuse me, I've got to take this phone call because he's my oversight. I don't want to be a man without authority in my life. No matter where I am, if my parents call me, no matter what meeting, I'll say, excuse me, I need to take this or I'll give the phone to somebody. Can you just take that? It's my parents. Can you just see if they're okay? Because I want to honour the authority. Sometimes my mother will just ring me up and say, do you want to come over for a curry? Like, mom, I'm in the middle of a session. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I still need to honour that authority in my life. If Sharon calls me at any time, I know, you know, we, we're one, that I want to honour her above every other person in my world. And so I make sure that I always take her phone call. So it's never, you know, there are certain people, and I know Pastor Peter does this for me all the time, Peter will literally go, it's PJ, excuse me, I need to take this. Hi, PJ, I'm just lecturing at the moment, but can I call you back, you know? And stuff like that is just so, so important that we honour our authority. And instantly, when you do that to your authority, their natural behaviour is, I want to promote you. I want to bless this person. This person is for me. And that's what I had to tell my son. Does the school think you are for them? Do the teachers think you are for them? Or do they think you're the leader of the rebellion against them? <laughs> you know, it's just so important, right? How do others, how do your authorities see you? Are you the pain in the neck? Or are you the joy? You know, and all of you are leaders. All of you have teams under you or working with or around you. You can right now list the pain in the necks, right? You can list those people that you wish the Lord would move on to another team. The ones that promise that don't come through and the ones that talk behind your back, the ones that's always negative, the ones that are quitting and starting up and quitting again and starting up, you know, they, they're volunteers that um, perfectly uh, dis are described by the Master Chef theme song, you know, you're hot and then you're cold, you're yes and then you're no, you're in and you're out, you're up and then you're down, you know what I mean? Uh, we, we all know people like that, but then there's people under us that you go, oh, I tell you what, you know, they're good people, people that you want in your life and people that you just can rely on. And those are the ones I make my campus pastors. <laughs> those are the ones I put on the staff at Centre Point. Those are the ones I give departments to because I can't handle the other ones being so close. And so when you submit to authority and you serve authority and you release the authority above you, if you make life easier for the authority above you, you just watch God just bless you through them and through other sources, you know? So that's the whole session on authority. Recognize that God is the ultimate authority and the authority is set up by God. Understand that every organization has to have authority and we all have authority that we need to come under and uh, how to correct authority as well, okay? Closing comments. You either have to give me a brilliant comment on authority, thoughts, experiences, or you have to ask me a question. And you have 11 minutes to go through all of you. So one minute each. Who would like to start? Your time starts now. Wow. <laughs> Come on. Final gold star, Michaela. Oh, Neil. Good on you. Um, all right, I I uh, I found out what uh, what authority is all about because <clears throat> um, I've pushed against the, against authority, and let's just say when I did that, I found myself in a courtroom and ended up with a conviction. I learned very quickly about authority. As soon as you step over that mark, or you Break the law or whatever else, come down upon you. Yeah, that, true. You know, some people are constantly scared around the police, right? You know, and, and here's the thing if you've got something to be scared of, then you should be scared, 
because they are an authority and they can punish. But if you're living according to what the, the law says, there is no fear in authority. There, there, there's an absolute ease and a trust, you know, especially in Australia, because we actually have a lot of integrity and honesty in our government and in our authority above us. Not perfect, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's what I'm but, trying to, that's what I'm teaching but, everybody at the moment is that, is, is that the police are there, not to make things difficult, but they're there to help you. Right? Yeah. So I come from Malaysia, if, you know, for all the faults we have here in Australia with this, that and the other, it's nothing, it's nothing compared to what the Prime Minister of Malaysia was doing to the country, you know, or any other country, all the police officers and stuff like that. So uh, uh, we honour authority not just because they're integral, we honour them because God has put them in a place of authority over us. But at the same time, we are so blessed to have good authority in our nation, especially right now. Okay, very good. Who's next go? Carolyn. Caroline. <laughs> um, you know, what I can say is about the um, whole leadership um, uh, topic, like for the whole semester. Um, it's really been an eye opener, and uh, it can be applied like individually in our everyday life and for our children. And also, um, I love the self um, uh, management uh, so much. And um, I'm just great. It's really been an eye opener, and I can really relate with my daily work, like at work and also my individual and also my spiritual life. So um, I'm just grateful to God that I've been in this class. And um, about authority, I just love the fact that God is, uh, has authority over all and uh, we should always recognize him as um, the, uh, every authority just depends on God. And uh, I think it's just, um, just letting even maybe teaching our children, you know, um, I think there's that stage of really, I, I got also teenagers and just, it's just been an eye opener also, I'm just going to talk to them about, you know, just honoring God and just making sure that, you know, they are maybe, uh, is it right before God or yeah, whatever they are doing and yeah, so I, I thank you so much. Beautiful, thank you, Carolyn. I love that. I love the whole thing that we're gonna apply this stuff on our daily, in our daily lives. Philo, closing comments, last time for the class. Yeah, so according to authority that you taught us, it's really like, you know, we had an experience before uh, as leaders that we saw another leader in our church uh, actually uh, impacting the culture of the church, that they, whatever they're doing is actually uh, breaking uh, or kind of diminishing the culture that the church created. So we were really wanted to like tell them and see where they're struggling with it because they had some unforgiveness that they are dealing with it. Uh, but we couldn't, they couldn't uh, really get from us. So we went to the pastor and, and spoke about it. But when we went to them, uh, we didn't really go as like they are wrong or, you know, they got to be, you know, but more like going in, can you please help them out? Because sometimes it's a lot of behavior comes out of something that we are struggling within. Um, so it's sometimes if it's been dealt, they can come out of that behavior or realize that behavior. So I really think that it really helped. And, and I think after we left it, it was, we had this question, is that enough telling them? But we left it to God to deal with that. Because it's beyond that, it was enough. But I have a question for you, Esther. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, one, um, you said that you started a full-time lead, uh, you know, full-time ministry 20 years ago. From 20 years ago, before your leadership uh, style and how you do leadership and qualities, uh, is it changed in these 20 years or are you still the same leader? Firstly, I had hair. Uh, I was about <laughs> 10 kilos lighter and had no grades, but uh, that's physical differences. Uh, in regards <laughs> to the leadership style, absolutely. With every revelation, with every experience, you should be changing your leadership style. As you start to feel a little bit more comfortable in who God has made you to be, 
as you start to get a better, clearer picture of who God is and how he loves you, it changes. All of these things literally change you. And um, it's part of growth. In fact, I believe, I mean, I often tell this to the guys when we started the church. Many of our team are still with us that I started the church with, you know, and, and I'm still in good, good relationship with all those that we've sent out to other churches that helped us start our team. I would say things like, I cannot believe that you stuck with us after all my failings as a leader. I mean, times I lost my temper, times I uh, preached theologically unsound stuff, uh, times that uh, I misread a situation completely. I mean, our leaders are, are flawed. And um, these guys have been so gracious to forgive me, to love me, to to be with me, trust me. <laughs> you know, it's pretty amazing. It's really pretty amazing. But you should change. You should grow. You should uh, be more comfortable with yourself. You should be uh, have a greater self-awareness of how your leadership is affecting other people. Uh, you should have a, a growing sensitivity to other people's needs. And that all changes, you know, when you get married, you get disciple, when you have children, you learn sacrifice and you learn about the love of God. So it constantly changes. And I think um, that's good because when I'm 70 or 80 years old, I'm going to be a much better leader than I am today. And so um, the best is truly yet to come. So I hope that helps. Yes, love it. <laughs> uh, Norella and Ian, closing comments from the two of you. No, that's fine, dear. You can start. <laughs> fine. Look, what you say is gold. I mean, it really is. And as a parent, you know, even if your your kids are perfect most of the time and they they do uh, reject your authority on a on an occasion, you still you'll love them. Of course, that won't change, but you will still correct. And um, and that's just the way it is with our heavenly Father too. He loves us enough to to correct us when we stray too far from what is right. Yeah, that's yeah, just anyway a bit off the track, but anyway. Kind of good. No, that's so good. That is so good. There are always consequences to mm. our rebellion, but it's not because of a lack of love. It's actually for our. I love that. That's the Father's heart revealed right there. Yep. And, and we have the choice, of course, to be a blessing to Him or to bring Him grief. He'll still love us. <laughs> that's right. Beautifully said. Narelle? I think having God as the overall authority on everything, both here in heaven and on earth, is just yes. just beautiful. Um, we can come up against earthly authority and we know decisions are wrong, but we know that we have a higher authority that we can go to. And he will sort that for us, whether it's the right way or the wrong way, in our mind. But in God's mind, it's the right way. Yeah, beautiful. Fantastic. Fair and me. Say woo. Um I think the question that I have is when it comes to like leadership, like how do you deal with like moments of self doubt? Like when you like or if you don't feel adequate, like how have you like tackled that? Yeah. It's a knowing that you are never enough without Christ. You're never ready. You will always feel inadequate and it will always drive you to needing Christ. You know, in fact, the moment you feel like you can do this by yourself, you're probably in dangerous territory. So every time I feel inadequate, uh, it's a natural reminder that um, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. <laughs> the number of times I've prayed that scripture over myself as I'm standing in the front row going, God, I don't want to do this, 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 I don't know what to do, I don't know how to leave this, I don't know, it's going to be so hard. I have to still myself go, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon Joel. He has anointed me to lead. He has anointed me to preach. He has anointed me to bring healing. And I've got to remind myself that I cannot do it, but I am covered. I cannot do it for myself, but I am called. I cannot do it for myself, but I will do it and it will go well because God is with me. 
So it's this constant, um, this constant wrestle, but also a constant reminder that um, we are anointed for everything that he has called us to. And if we are anointed to do it, then we will accomplish it and it will go well. Um, I wish I could tell you there's something you do to get rid of ina inadequacies or feelings of uh, being unprepared, but there isn't. <laughs> it's just an ongoing wrestle for the rest of your life. You'll feel it as a husband, you'll feel it as a father, you'll feel it as a mother, you'll feel it as an employer, you'll feel it as a minister. You'll never feel like you've got it all together. Yay, he says. <laughs> that gives me so much hope. Woohoo! <laughs> but isn't it wonderful to know that everybody is in the same boat? You know, because like you can believe this lie from the enemy that Craig Rochelle doesn't feel this. Well, he does. You know, or, or some other big um, uh, hero of yours doesn't have that, but they do. And if they're really honest, then they will be saying the same thing. Hey, listen, let's do this with God and let's do whatever he's called us together. We can do it through him. So, fantastic. Michaela, second last. Um, I really liked what you're saying about um, what Pastor Sally said about always being able to give the authority back to, like, the authority always goes back to God. Because it just, like, having that last step, there's a finishing point. You never have to keep being like, oh, they're doing this wrong. You can always be, like, worried about someone else doing something wrong, but being able to just hand it back to God and being like, okay, God's, God's doing this now and just letting it go completely. Just, yeah, it makes you feel a lot, like, better, lighter. You're not carrying other people's stuff. Like, you just have to worry about where you are with God, which is very freeing yes beautiful i love that final word of wisdom just into good note um my one of the things you said was not humiliating your leader um i feel like that's really important because like you just said everybody has these thoughts of doubt and things like that every person so if we were to humiliate them in front of people that would only make more of a burden for them I guess like you would make them feel discouraged in their leadership and that's definitely not something we would like to be done to us so why should we do it to somebody else I think definitely honoring the people above you and having a conversation and not just some um, saying hey you're doing this wrong so yeah. I really like it. yeah that's so good all right well closing thoughts from me thank you for sharing that Jacinta two Thoughts. Number one, David's at the in the middle of a war in the Bible, Old Testament, and he goes, ah, if only I could get a drink from the well of Jerusalem. And the Bible says the three men heard that plea from their leader. They decide we're going to do whatever it takes to bless our boss. And they break through the ranks and they do it. And it so touches David when they come back with a glass of water that David says, I cannot even consume this water. It is such a precious gift. It only it is so valuable, it's so precious that it, I want to give it to God. Right? It, these three men heard the cry of the heart of their leader and did whatever they could to bless them, to release him to do what he's called to do, to honour him, you know. And, you know, when you adopt that mentality, and I'm, please understand, I know I, to some extent I'm, I'm your senior pastor. I'm not asking you to do this for me. But every leader in your life, if you adopt that mentality that I'm going to refresh them, that I'm going to bless them, I'm going to release them, I tell you what, they will go to another level. But do you know what happens when they go to another level? You immediately go up to another level. You and I have the opportunity of blessing the people above us. And that's what Sharon and I have determined in our lives. We will be the water bringers to all the authority that God has put over our lives. We'll be the refreshing. We'll be the encouragement. And when they go up, 
I know God will bless us. All right? So that's number one. Number two, your last piece of homework, which I will not judge and be able to uh, mark you on, is I want you to think of one authority that you can bless. And I'm not in that list, okay? So you can't do it for me. But I want you to think about one authority in your life, especially if you struggle with them. Okay, now some of you may have no one that you're struggling with who's an authority, but I want you to think of one authority that you struggle with, and I want you to work out a way to give them a glass of cold water, give them an encouragement that refreshes them. Look, out of the blue, don't say, I've been asked that I have to do it because it's an assignment for Bible college. All right? Uh, <laughs> that will steal the blessing. I'm being forced to bless you and I have a problem with you, you know, but I'm blessing you anyway. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Just bless them. Just say, hey, listen, I just want to thank you for being my authority, my covering. I want to thank you for leading. I honor you because God has put you over my life and uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here for you. Okay? Let me pray for you and then I'm going to release you. Lord bless these amazing leaders. I thank you for each and every one of them. Thank you for the last seven and a half weeks where we've been able to just be with each other and learn from each other. Lord, I just pray a blessing on their households, on their marriages, on their families, on their futures, on their employment. Lord, everything that we've talked about and learned according to your word, help us to use for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Derek. Awesome. So good. Can you believe it? Semester one is pretty much done and dusted. Woo! Thank That's you, PJ.